Hello everyone, today we'll talk about the degradation of fighting power of combat effectiveness of German troops throughout the Second World War and for this we have as a guest Professor Neitzel from the University of Potsdam. Hello. Professor Neitzel, you, you have your own thesis about how the fighting power of the Wehrmacht degraded over the war and there was a certain important points how, how it developed so when we start in 1939 to 1941 how in this time frame it developed i mean in poland you could clearly see that the wehrmacht was not the super army and it was unexperienced obviously uh, it was when I mean, we have to remember uh, in 1933 it was 100,000 men and in 1939 it was about 2.6 million so it was a huge expansion and of course, with this expansion, there was a loss of quality. You don't, the Reichswehr could not provide enough NCOs, well-trained NCOs, well-trained officers for an army of that size of 2.6 million men. And you could see this in Poland. I mean, yes, the Germans won on the military side the campaign in Poland. But if you read through, and I did this in my, in my book, um, German Warriors, Deutsche Krieger. If you read through the German reports, after action reports, Erfahrungsberichte, uh, they are not very pleased with the performance. Um, and in the end, the, the difference, the big difference and the decisiveness or what decided the war was the 15 motorized divisions the tank divisions and the motorized infantry divisions, they made the difference because they had the speed and they, you know, performed the maneuver warfare in a way no other army could perform it. But all the others, I mean, there were brave soldiers, etc., but uh, there were massive problems, massive problems. And the German reports are very critical with that. Of course, the, um, luckily for the German army, they had a big break after Poland. They could train the soldiers, um, a lot of maneuvers, etc. Um, and then they, they came 1940. And then the performance, also in their own reflection on the tactical level, was much better than in Poland. There were still problems, um, but the after action reports were much more positive. Although they said, you know, this, we were fighting in very, very, you know, happy circumstances because there was a little, uh, little French um, air power against us uh, and there was very bad leadership on the French side. And if we are fighting against an, an enemy with a strong air force uh, and a strong leadership, uh, the turnout might be totally different. Um, and obviously we know that the Wehrmacht had the higher leadership sometimes did not really uh, adopted to the blitzkrieg tactics um, uh, and that there are tank generals who were, you know, disobeying uh, orders and by this, you know, breaking through at the Meuse, etc, etc, etc. But on the tactical level, the performance was much better. And the Wehrmacht, again after France, had, had a break and, and could refresh its troops, can you know, train the troops. And it reached its, its professional, tactical professional ability, possibly uh, in summer 41. Um, and as we all know, the, the idea was, you know, a, a quick a quick offensive against the Soviet Union, which then might collapse under um, the attacks of the Wehrmacht, which did not happen. The problem for the Wehrmacht was that um, the Wehrmacht um, was not prepared for a marathon. It was a sprinter. So, uh, a short campaign and then refreshments. Short campaign, then time um, to, re to regroup. The problem of, of the Soviet Union was there was no time to regroup. And you could see that um, endless German victories and, 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 and big battles the Germans won, but the German casualties were, were huge. And so um, somehow by the end of 1941 the Germans had lost then, I don't know, 300,000 soldiers were killed and, and a lot of tanks, etc, etc, etc. So um, this was uh, only a shadow of its own capabilities in comparison to June 41. Um, and then in, in 42, of course, there was a, a bit of a refreshment, etc, etc, etc. And I think the, the really going down moment the break-even point was summer 43, where 
again, there was a bit of a break from the spring to summer campaign. Uh, and then was an endless fighting against the Red Army. Uh, and the Germans could not cope with that, especially not with the losses. And you could clearly see that even in August 43, the Germans used 250,000 tons of ammunition uh, to stop the Red Army in that only month. But they could not stop the Red Army. Um, they, the Red Army could take these high, these high casualties, but the Germans could not take these casualties. And especially if you look not at the elite SS divisions, but at the infantry divisions. The infantry divisions for that time period of, of the war did not have enough firepower. There was a cry for automatic weapons, like the Sturmgewehr 44. There was a cry for Sturmgeschütze, uh, a battalion, an Abteilung for every infantry division. There was a cry for firepower. But uh, the Germans were not able to provide these infantry divisions, the regular normal divisions, with enough firepower to defend itself against the Red Army. The consequence were very high casualties, an endless uh, rate of high casualties. And the quality of the infantry, the professionalism of the infantry was going down. Because the good men, the, the qualified men, they all came into the Waffen-SS, into the tank divisions, into the elite forces. But there was, in the documents, generals arguing, you can't win a war with elite divisions. You must have a qualified mass army. Um, and you can't, the infantry divisions normally get then the second rate, the third rate personnel. Um, and again, who died very quickly on the Eastern Front. So I, my argument would be that the real break even point in the professionalism of the German army, the Wehrmacht in the Second World War, was not Autumn 44 the time with the very high losses uh, where they lost the West and the East. But it was well before. And in summer, late summer 43, they started a process where it was constantly, massively going down, um, which also then you could see um, the German ability to counterattack was uh, almost gone. Um, and there were nothing, no operations like February 43 counterattack against um, Sharkov. Uh, or counter-attack even in North Africa. Um, so that's, I think, um, very clear if you look at the infantry divisions. Um, to a degree, you could say, um, already in winter 43, 44, the Wehrmacht was, was somehow a shadow of itself. So basically, the Wehrmacht needed time to recuperate after each campaign and then to fight again. And since there was constant pressure on it, it started basically a death spiral that everything degraded more and more down and it could basically only defend at that point but hold on to the territory they had but couldn't counterattack properly anymore. Exactly. So, so um, the just Germans couldn't take that much, these huge amounts of casualties. And if you, if you compare the amount of casualties from the First World War and the Second World War, the Germans reached in uh, somehow in spring um, 43, uh, it's somehow in comparison to the First World War, spring 1918, if, if, it ju if you just count the casualties. Um, and yeah, then, then they have lost more than two million men, capable men, uh, trained officers. Uh, and it was very hard to replace them. Uh, so in a way, the Germans would have needed half a year of a break to regroup, to refresh. Um, but they didn't have that. Or if you would jump a bit in, in counterfactual history, what would have happened if the Germans would have to fight against the French in November 39, which was the wish of Hitler, e immediately after the Polish campaign attack in France? I wouldn't think that, that the German Wehrmacht would have been able to defeat France uh, in the winter 39, 1940. They really needed the time of, of regroup, of, of, of training, of fill up uh, the gaps. Uh, and this was one of the reasons why they were so successful in 39 to 41, that in, in their kind of maneuver warfare tactics, they could only have short campaigns because the campaigns were so, the casualty rate was so high. You have regiments in France who lost 30% of their officers in just six weeks. So if you now go to 41, 42, I mean, what are six weeks? It's nothing. 
it's three years. And you could see that a normal tank division lost its, its, its combat strength in, over the weeks and the month, even on, on the advance. So that's, that's uh, the, whole, the whole concept. And therefore, I mean, we all know that the German strategy um, yeah, uh, was lost and, and Germany had somehow was defeated, not only in December 41, but uh, definitely earlier. In autumn 41, uh, in a moment when it was clear that the Soviet Union was not collapsing. But the Germans needed the collapse, a quick collapse of the enemy. In Poland, France, in Yugoslavia. And they could fight for three months or so, but not longer. Uh, and therefore, autumn 41, I think it, it was clear that Germany was defeated. Now, in terms of constant pressure, when we also look at the bigger picture, outside of the army, so against the Reich itself, when the, the bombers were directed and everything, how much did add this to, to also degrade from, from the industrial and logistical side the, the fighting power of the German army on the Eastern Front? This is, I think, a highly debated topic. Yeah. So the impact of the air war and, and the strategic air bombing, I mean, definitely you, you couldn't see, couldn't, couldn't argue that the, the air war against Germany was in vain. I mean, definitely the, the air war had a massive impact. Um, not in the sense of the British that they thought, you know, the German might surrender. But um, this was then argued by, by, by Philip Bryan in his, in his, um, book, um, in the latest Cambridge University book, that um, the Germans were forced by the British and then the American air offensive to fight a high-tech war, to defend Germany in the air. And a tank, even a Tiger tank or Panther tank, is not no high-tech. The Germans in 43, 44 spent just 6% of their resources into tank production but more than 40% of their resources into the air industry. And this was, at this time of the war, mainly used to defend the Reich against Allied air attacks. So a night fighter was very expensive. This was very high-tech. A truck or a tank was not very expensive and was, you know, from a technical point of view, a very simple tool. Um, so the British and the Americans forced the Germans to spend a lot of money, efforts, working hours, etc., into the air industry um, to defend itself. And by this, and also to withdraw the fighter units um, and Kampfgeschwader, etc., from the Eastern Front to the West. And by this, this was, I think, the major precondition that um, the Red Army was able to push the Wehrmacht out of its country. If you, a bit counterfactual history, think the Germans would have invested all this money and effort into tank production, they could have produced thousands of thousands of thousands of tanks more. Uh, and by this, um, it might have been able then also to stop the Red Army, or even to slow down massively the advance of the Red Army. So therefore, um, the bombing and the fighting on various fronts, and especially the, the, the air war, the expensive air war, and also to a degree, the, the Battle of the Atlantic goes in the same direction, high-tech war, very, very expensive. Um, so the fighting against the, the Western Allies forced um, the Germans to spend so much money for that kind of war. And in the way, the, the, the war on the Eastern Front was a cheap war, if you want. Uh, and then, of course, it was a combination of all these factors um, who were then responsible for the defeat of Germany. But it was definitely the impact also for for this bombing of Germany on the war on the Eastern Front. So if we oversimplify this a bit, usually Eastern Front is portrayed as a bit of a meat grinder. So in that sense, we could say the Western Front till 1944 was mostly a tech grinder. That Germany was grinded down on the industrial side and on, on the technology level, and also where they spent the engineers and, and, and scientists. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely, I mean, these are both very important factors. On the Eastern Front, the Germans lost the man, and on the Western Front, the, the Germans lost, lost money uh, and resources. And, of course, both factors are very important. I mean, you can't 
overemphasize the thing, it's only the Western Front is, is decisive. Of course, the, the, the meat grinder and the manpower was very important. And the Germans just were, you know, was a deprofessionalizing process because of the losses on the Eastern Front. And that the Germans were not able to cope with Sicily, with Salerno, with Anzio, had also its reason that they have lost so many experienced officers and NCOs on the Eastern Front. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we if we put a long story short, then it's definitely the Germans lost the men on the Eastern Front and the material and, and the and the resources on the Western Front and the both the combination of both then um, the result is then the German defeat. Well, I think there's not much to add here from my side. Only that your book covers from 1980 uh, from 1871 to 2020, basically all German armed forces. So if you're interested, be sure to check out the book of Western Neitzel. Big thank you here. Yeah, thank you very much and bye bye. Also, thank you to Flo and Tony from Real Time History for providing their infrastructure and resources here. As always, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.